want to call the September meeting of the Land Use Committee of the Sioux Falls City Council to order for today, September 17th. Welcome to everybody here in the chambers and to those on Channel 16 listening and watching at home. Thank you very much for being here. Um, like to, uh, or I would entertain a motion for approval of the minutes of uh, Tuesday, July 16th, our last meeting. So move. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, today we have a um, couple of uh, agenda items um, ranging from uh, TIF to annexation. And we'll start with um, uh, agenda item A, annexation and some pending things that are happening. And Jeff, I guess you're here instead of Mike. Thank you, Denise. Jeffrey Schmidt from the Planning Office, and this is a question and answer period for City Council uh, at the Land Use Committee to talk about annexations. The annexation ordinance was adopted uh, back in December of 2005 when we drafted this to try to put some of the policies that we currently had in place into law. We've been uh, in front of the Land Use Committee twice over the last two years, you know, trying to keep to this July time frame, but now it's September, so this is the third time that we've been in front of the Land Use Committee, just kind of giving you an overview of what annexations are. There's two types of annexations, again, more for the viewing public than anything else, and to try to keep them uh, understood better, I put them in categories. You have petitioned by landowners versus not petitioned or with, um, without a petition. And this is the state law classification. On the left-hand side, 99 plus percent of our, ordinance, our annexations um, are these types of land areas. We do 15 a year um, and 996 acres such as the 6th and Mile and Madison Avenue, 85th and Grange, 85th and Minnesota, 85th and Tall Grass. Those are those types of annexations. Now, annexations without petitions are studies where we take a significant amount of time to go through these. Um, you can see we've done, in my time here, we've done four. Um, we started these, uh, the July 2006 Brandy one, I'd like to highlight that for you because that's coming in front of City Council tonight to pass that resolution. We started that in October, January of 2004 we brought it in front of City Council in July of 2006 and we're annexing them tonight in 2013. They take about nine years to do an annexation uh, without petition. So you still have Prairie Meadows, Cactus Heights, and Split Rock Plus out there for annexations without petitions. And then in conclusion, this is annexations in our waves. You've seen this now three times. We have approximately 50 annexations out there that we need to bring forward to you for decision making. Uh, these annexations without petitions um, are in waves. They're highlighted here. We have an annexation program that we try to stress to the public to understand when should we expect to be annexed or how does the annexation work. Again, we never had this in place prior to 2011 when we put it into uh, process and brought it forward to this land use committee. Um, but we're, again, trying to communicate better with the public so that they understand what annexations are. So really with that, I just wanted to open it up to questions for you to see if you had issues and concerns about annexations. Yes, Councilor Karski. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's an interesting map, a lot of pretty colors, but big question, I guess, is how, fall, how close do we follow that first, second, third, fourth, fifth wave? If somebody wanted to come in, you know, there's a little green triangle, or it's, it's pretty much contiguous with our city limits. Um, it's the fourth wave, which is how many years out? Sure. 20. 20? Yep. Um, I mean, do we follow that? I mean, is that like, okay, we're not going to do this until we do that, or is it? How hard and fast are we on these things? We're not hard and fast on these things. That's why they're not in time frames. They're in waves. And the waves really try to just generalize the public when should they expect to be annexed. Um, for specifics, when we look at first waves, you can see they're a little bit closer to the city of Sioux Falls. The most of the first waves are internal to the city of Sioux Falls, and they're already in city limits. They should be annexed first. 
We're looking at one on the west side of town right now. It's in the city of Sioux Falls. It's in city limits. We should, on the west side of town, uh, annex that property first. The other one we're looking at is Cactus Heights in the northeast part of town. That's in second wave. Um, it's internal to the city of Sioux Falls. It has a couple other issues, but that doesn't mean we're going to do all of the first wave annexations before we get to that one at Cactus Heights. So that's more specific how we answer your question. Okay, so if a property owner wants to annex their land and it's not even in the first through the fourth wave, we wouldn't say, well, we don't really have plans for that, but this would fit based on what you're looking at? How do we go about that? Yes, that's correct. But it's not property owner, it's property owners. Um, you know, Cactus Heights is probably 50 to 60 property owners. Uh, Prairie Meadows is 60 property owners. So I usually have one that comes and goes, I want to be annexed. And I go, yeah, but what about the other 60? So how do you manage those? That's why it takes you nine, 10 years to say, okay, it's time to be annexed. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sagers. Yes, Jeff. Uh, the issue we're going to deal with tonight, where, where's that located at? Okay. Brandy Avenue is at 85th and Western Avenue. It's this blue one right here. It says it's a fifth wave. Actually, it's just to the west of that, sir. Um, it's at 85th and Western Avenue right here. And okay. Brandy Avenue is on the southeast corner. Um, they were surrounded by the city limits. Uh, they had Brandy Avenue as their access point back in 2004. A development was taking place that needed Brandy Avenue to develop. So we brought this discussion forward that says everybody needs Brandy Avenue in order to develop. And so we started the process to say come into the city of Sioux Falls. Um, there's three houses on the east side of Brandy Avenue. We signed this agreement back in 2006 with them. And now in 2013, they've all signed it again, saying we want to be in the city of Sioux Falls. We're going to hook up to water, sewer, fix the roads. So they're signing the petition saying we want to be in the city of Sioux Falls. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, it's, uh, we're not coercing them to be annexed. Is that right? They're voluntarily wanting to be annexed? Yes, they are volunteering to be okay. annexed. Okay. I wouldn't want to say coercing. Well, sometimes we do, but right. uh, yeah. They're volunteering. They have signed a voluntary petition, these three property owners that you will see tonight, correct? Okay, yes. sounds good. And hook up to utilities and pay for them. Okay, yep. spend lots of money. Yep. Okay. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Okay, this is at 85th and Western, correct? Correct. Okay, um, is any part of that, that Ronning development that's happening down there by the Harrisburg schools? Um, this annexation? It's in that vicinity, but no. Ronning's development at 85th and Western is on the southeast corner. Brandy's adjacent to that. The Harrisburg schools are the southwest corner at 95th and Western. So it's a quarter mile, half a mile away from the Harrisburg schools. Where are we at with that Ronning development as far as annexation there? Has there been any discussion? The southeast corner of 85th and Western, the Ronning development was annexed back in 2003. Okay, so that is within the city. Correct. Going south. Going south, yep. And Ronning's Pinewood Edition goes south on, eight, on um, Western Avenue a quarter mile, and then it's another quarter mile down to 95th Street, and on the west side is where the Harrisburg schools are. If I may. Yes. Um, <clears throat> now to discuss uh, another location, and that would be 42nd and 46th mm -hmm. uh, and the T. Ellis Road. That is something where we went to that neighborhood to discuss the issues there and gave them some options. One of them was annexation. Could you speak to that, please? Certainly. Um, Prairie Meadows is the red first wave on the west side of town. This is one of the uh, most important critical annexations that we're trying to address. We in Stockwell's Engineering is also here this afternoon to, if there's any questions specifically for an engineering firm. They were hired by Prairie Meadows to look at some of their utility issues. We started first meeting with Prairie Meadows um, back in 2010, I believe, was my, my first meeting. And then Stockwell's had a meeting with them in 2011. Um, both of those meetings were public meetings where we said, we will be annexing you in the future. Uh, we're coordinating their annexation uh, with the 41st Street construction project. There's, and again, I'm ballparking at approximately 70 homeowners, property owners out there in Prairie Meadows. They're currently within our city limits. You can see on the north and south 
east that are surrounded by city limits. They're on our sanitary sewer system. Um, they have their own their sanitary district, but they use our sewer system. They're on wells and they don't have uh, city improved streets or a drainage system for storm sewer. So they have issues and concerns from a utility standpoint. The last meeting we had with the property owners was June 27th at Roosevelt High School where we invited all the property owners out. We had an informal survey where we said, yes or no, do you want to be annexed? Yes or no, do you want to pay for your utilities? Yes and no, do you want these? Generally, when you talk to people, they go, annexation's fine. We don't, being in the city of Sioux Falls, getting fire protection, police protection, code enforcement, we're, nobody wants to pay for anything. It, it doesn't come to a surprise if city council understand. They go, yeah, I understand. We want to be in the city limits. We believe we should have basic services. We should have good water, good sewer, good roads. Then you get to that last, yeah, but who should have to pay for it? And that's where everything usually breaks down on annexations. And they go, yeah, but who's going to have to pay for them? Um, and then in conclusion with Kenny's question, when we met out there with the one property owner, it's $25,000 a lot um, for these property owners out there. Some of them own more than one lot. $25,000 will give them, once it gets all installed and completed, a updated sewer system, updated water system, updated storm sewer system, curbs, gutters, roads, sidewalks, fire hydrants, street lights, a complete city development. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dean, if you'd like. Oh, I don't want to step in it's on it. It's going to get long. 25000 do we say, tell them, write us a check? I mean, how do we ask for, is it paid over a certain number of years? How do we do that? Yes, excellent question. It goes, again, the annexation goes in front of city council, and you say, are you in the city of Sioux Falls or not? That's the gist of the annexation. Then you, again, work with city public works and engineering to go, okay, now we need to do a resolution of necessity to do the utility improvements, and then you do assessments on those property owners, and you assess, again, those roles. You'll get that role in front of city council to assess each one of the property owners. Typically, um, again, this is what we've explained to the property owners. Typically, city council looks at a five-year term, and the prime rate is the interest rate plus 3% because the city of Sioux Falls would go out and get a bank loan to fix this project or improve this project and then charge on 3% on prime. So it's interest rate plus 3%, five-year term, and then we do an assessment on those property owners. And then, again, as I was telling Stockwells, um, I got a phone call from a gentleman that's interested in buying a house out there today, and he said, so, but I don't have to pay it off over five years, do I? I mean, I can pay it off immediately. I'm like, yes or you don't have to pay it off in less than five years either. You can go and get another bank loan, a 20-year bank loan, and pay off this five-year loan. And ha All we're saying is you have five years to pay us back. So that's the long answer to your question. Councilor Anderson? Okay. <clears throat> okay, as we go through this, um, I guess what I'm trying to get to is using this uh, properties out here as an example of some of the uh, pitfalls and challenges when we are looking at these 50 plus properties to try to annex them in. Uh, as Jeff said, you know, we've met with the property owners out there. Uh, a few have co contacted myself uh, and thanks to Jeff and Stockwell Engineering and our uh, city planning and engineering offices we met with uh, one of the uh, property owners to discuss some of the issues out there. Uh, the drainage is, is something that is uh, real interesting. Uh, the, yellow, the yellow box next to the red section on the map, is that the cornfield? Yes, that's Schildauer's property on the east. So uh, that is totally undeveloped property mm -hmm. there. Um, also, the water district has gotten a grant to try to help yes. with their storm uh, sewer drainage. How would that grant affect the per lot amount that is that we're looking at right now? I know it's yep. just estimated. That, that's built into it right now to keep their costs down at that $25,000. Um, through Stockwell's 
engineering work that they analyzed how much it's going to cost to make all these improvements. Then the Southeastern Council of Governments went to the state and got a sanitary improvement district grant. And got a grant and a loan for approximately $800,000 so that they can improve their sanitary sewer system. They can't get funds for water, roads, or storm sewer, but they can get sanitary sewer funds in, again, this ballpark of $800,000. Um, the $25,000 figure is after that $800,000 considered because, again, it's $2 million for storm sewer and $2 million for roads and $2 million. It's an expensive project to improve everything out there. Um, and then, again, when we've given all this information to the property owners, again, Stockwell has presented it in sheets that says this is what your five-year monthly cost would be at 3% plus prime, and, and they've laid out all those costs. Now, also, since they are already on our storm sewer system. Sanitary sewer system. Sanitary system, system excuse yep. me. Um, and with some of the problems that are out there, because yes. to the south of this property is city, city property, mm -hmm. and it is developed with curb and gutter and some storm sewer. Uh, what I was, in our discussions, uh, this area basically was developed with the minimum standards, right. uh, and after taking a drive through that area, I, I had some major concerns about how the drainage is impacting this unannexed area also. Um, with that being said, uh, we talked about the number of years that we have, the, the five years for right. payback, uh -huh. and uh, if I could get someone from Stockwell up for yep. a moment. I'd Absolutely. like to, in our discussion, we talked about the five year, but I would like you to also explain how your company does that interacting with other smaller communities. Uh, John Brown with Stockwell Engineers here in Sioux Falls. We represent Prairie Meadows. We also do a fair amount of work for you folks. And we also represent small communities as you indicated. Um, a lot of times uh, working with smaller communities and just different uh, communities really as a whole uh, to try to make these projects a little more feasible for them. We spread out those terms a little bit longer and then we don't necessarily tack on as much of an interest rate for to cover your costs. So when we deal with uh, uh, some of these other uh, smaller communities that are looking at these same situations where they do a resolution necessity to annex them uh, but then they also do a uh, assessment project to assess utilities, water, sewer, things like that. Um, we go through this same process where we educate the council, we educate the public, you know, the people that are affected by it, and then, uh, you know, the, the hard part is the cost and how do you pay for that. And so what we try to do is, is lay it out the best we can so that they realize what those costs will be. And those are just estimates at this point, but then, um, you uh, go through the process of annexing them and uh, doing the uh, uh, resolution of necessity to assess those utilities. And then over uh, what you try to do is a little bit uh, more like a 20 year term, maybe rather than a five or 10, because that has a tendency to be a little more uh, feasible for some of these individuals. Now that just gives them an opportunity to do that. A lot of people want to pay it off right away because they don't want to pay the interest. They don't want to spread out those terms. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Dean. For Jeff, if I could. This neighborhood out here, Jeff, there's a lot of newer homes out there. I mean, they're not that old. I mean, there's some older ones, yep. there's some newer ones, kind of a good mix, real close to um, Pettigrew School. What kind of joint zoning do we have to prevent this from happening <clears throat> in the future? I mean, how did this happen, or how can we prevent this from happening? Oh, boy, that's our excellent question. Um, this Prairie Meadows district was back in the 50s and 60s, and in 1970s, they had a septic system that was really bad, and the federal government came to the city of Sioux Falls and said, you need to take them in the city of Sioux Falls, um, and that's where they came with the Prairie Meadows Sanitary Improvement District. That's the history of Prairie Meadows. Since that time, they've added significant amounts of homes on that district, which they really shouldn't have, because I even have a letter from the city engineer, Ray Jorgensen, back in the 70s saying, well, we'll do this as long as they don't add more homes. 
but they did. Um, how do you control houses outside of our jurisdiction? It's working through the counties and with the counties. And you can see that a lot of these are large subdivisions. I mean, Pine Lake, Split Rock, Pine Lake Hills, Revilla Estates, the Polo Grounds. And they were developed or approved maybe in the 60s and the 70s, and their lots were approved out there, and they're still being built on. Nowadays, in 2013, if someone came in um, and said, I want to build a housing subdivision in your growth area and want to put up 100 houses, they'd have to go through your body as the joint planning and zoning, and then they go, I mean, they go to your joint elected, and you would make that decision going, is this the appropriate thing to do to let a housing subdivision be outside of our city limits on septic and sand? And you would decide that. That's how it, it's done. We're fixing the sins of past 40 years. These aren't new subdivisions that are coming in. You know, when you say it's up to us, I mean, to approve something outside, you mean but up to us in conjunction with the county or? No, it's in our joint area. Okay. In oh. our joint area. Okay, so we, because it's in the joint area, we each get a vote on it. Correct. So we approve it in the county. Okay, yes. I got you. Um, and not to pick on one, but I'm going to pick on this one. There is on South Louise Avenue, there is a housing subdivision on South Louise Avenue that's not in our joint area. It's outside of our joint area that got <coughs> allowed in Lincoln County to be built out there. At some point, you know, in 30 years, 40 years, and 50 years, they're going to have issues and concerns that a future council in 40, 50 years is going to sit here and go, how did they allow this development on South Louise Avenue to come in and be developed? And we're going to go, it wasn't in our joint jurisdiction. The county approved it. Uh, you sit there and go, haven't we learned from our mistakes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Councilor Anderson. Not so much a question, but I think that this discussion needs further review, and especially as we look at having up to 50 different uh, housing areas yep. that could be annexed in, in in the very near future, and how each one of them is going to have their unique issues in trying to meet our city codes and our requirements. And then also taking a look at some of the developments that have been done with these minimum standards. Um, the, the development out in that area, I would say from the cornfield to the west where it butts into this, un, this uh, unimproved area, let's say there's eight blocks there. Out of the eight blocks, six of them do not have storm sewer drains. And it, even though our engineering, with all due respect, says that it's not impacting uh, this this uh, undeveloped area, uh, you know, we're getting ready to add two retention ponds on the expansion of 41st Street because everything drains to the north right through this, this development here. So I think when we had our discussion with the one property owner, he kept coming back saying, well, the city did this, and, and there was the one thing we really had to drive in, into him was that we had nothing to do with this. What we're coming out and saying is that we can fix this, but this is what's going to happen. I asked about different options. If we could leave that as a rural, similar to like uh, Old Orchard trails, things like that, where it was just paved roads. But because of the drainage issues, yeah. this area would have to get curb and gutter, curb and, gutter. and the whole nine yards. Orchard so. Heights, Hayward, um, the uh, Norton, Froelich, all those were forcible annexations that they're, everyone's different, but Kenny brings up a point. The one issue that has to be addressed at Prairie Meadows is storm sewer, and that's the one thing that they really don't want to talk about. They go, yeah, if you fix our sanitary sewer and we give us water, and we go, but you really need roads and you need storm sewer. That's the problem. And then you go, at that point, you've got to put in $25,000 worth of improvements. Yeah. And, I, and if I can add, I think that Stockwell's brought up a really good point that we need to look at. <clears throat> How long have we sat and just used that five-year plan for the assessments? Would it help bringing some of these in and getting them developed the proper way 
would it help to have uh, maybe a 10-year or a 15-year assessment? And that's something that I hope this committee will take a look at. Other questions? I have a couple, a comment or two, and then a couple of questions. Um, first, I agree with uh, Councillor Anderson on <clears throat> looking at a uh, 10 or maybe a 15-year plan on this financing program, which might make it more palatable and make this uh, uh, be a little more acceptable for the people coming in uh, into the program. I can see where the five-year program on a 25-year uh, plan, uh, you're looking at a $5,000 a year um, uh, bump in your property taxes, basically, yep. uh, and uh, that's in most cases a pretty good bump for for most people, and so uh, that might be something we can look at. And this is one of the reasons, Jeff, that I've been kind of on top of this and saying there's too many holes in this city, and I understand the tier, and I understand what you've told me about it's also a, a personnel issue at, in your department because we don't have the we don't have the personnel to go after this as. as as um, uh, rapidly as we'd like to be able to, able to. so um, uh, maybe uh, there would be something that you and Mike could come back with another with a plan to look at some of the things that we've discussed here um, okay. and see if there's if we need to um, get some people uh, involved in this because you know the property taxes alone would take care of the would take care of the um, uh, the extra person. Uh, to drive some of this, uh, if you look at it just from an economic standpoint alone. And so um, could you kind of take that back to Mike? And yes. if I need to drive it home, we'll drive it home. Okay. Um, but I think we need, to, we need to plug some of these holes um, rapidly if we can uh, because of some of the problems we've talked about and some of the problems that you've, uh, you've identified and some of the growth areas that, uh, you know, if we've identified our, our, our limits with uh, uh, with Harrisburg, um, you know, we need to take it down to there with uh, with this and with T and and Brandon and that kind of thing. We need to get out there and uh, make sure that we don't have some of these problems 30 years from now that we're going to have if we don't. If we just plain let people um, do the kind of thing that they've been doing before. Uh, next, <clears throat> if I'm a guy living in um, Prairie Meadows right now and I dial 911 and say uh, I have a fire, who comes? If you have a fire call, emergency service fire call, we have joint response from fire. Police is not the same, they call a sheriff. But from fire, we have joint response, so the city fire trucks will come out there. The township that they're in pays the city fire department, I think, in upwards between fifty and $70,000 a year to help them with that. Okay. So I hear from the township supervisors that they're upset that they're paying to do fire protection. So they could help themselves if they were annexed, they wouldn't have to pay fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. Right. Do do the Sioux Falls police show up at all? Uh, no, because it's a county sheriff issue. But fire protection does come out there. No, but when I, we come out there for fire, on 41st Street or whatever. But that when is. we come out there for fire, we don't have hydrants to hook up to, so you have to bring a pump or truck, and it's yeah. it's fighting fires with hoses, yeah. not equipment. I would bet a lot of money that there is probably a police car or two out there anyway, just to make sure that things are. That's not what Don okay. told us, but. Am I? Go ahead. Councilor and actually, Anderson. because there is the development right next to it. That development does have some fire hydrants that for some of that undeveloped area that it could help cover. Right. But not very not much. Not all of it. Yeah. yeah. Understood. Okay. Um, do we need to set some kind of a, a date for you to come back uh, a month uh, so that you could come back uh, after the items that we've discussed that I just and come back with some kind of a plan or something on this? Uh, yes. And Councilor? Be yeah, I'm something? just curious. I mean, is it, do we have a timeline? Are we looking at something happening in three months, six months, yeah, that's nine what, months? I guess I've given you some direction here. Um, right. I will ask, and will Mike Cooper and I will talk about resources and staffing. Um, the questions that really Kenny and Dean are bringing forward are council discussions that we need to have. And if you want to do it at informational or if you want to do it at land use, I'm amenable to either or, or. I can do them whenever you think it's appropriate. To really answer Mr. Karski's question, Prairie Meadows is on the back burners. We, 
Kenny told the neighbor, I mean, it's a property owner decision now. I'm not going out there and saying, hey, you're going to be annexed on Tuesday. It's when can they get this thing figured out because otherwise it's over the next nine years. Um, Cactus Heights, we're pretty close to bringing a resolution forward to you. Pretty close being six months, maybe. Um, but Prairie Meadows, I'm not anywhere near bringing a resolution unless they bring it forward. Yeah, unfortunately there we have to deal with not only the property owners, but the water district, uh, the sewer district, trying to get them together and in uh, one meeting. And, I think and they're waiting, and they're waiting for answers now. from you. They want to know what's the term and what's the interest rate. Right, and that once again, that will fall back to us as a council, on, as this committee. To bring us some ideas, yeah, and that's what I was talking about. If you could bring us some ideas, maybe on how we might be able to refinance that on a ten or fifteen year period. If, if you would just, do you want land use again or informational? Let's bring it back to land use. Okay, I will schedule something with Denise, and we'll be okay. back in land Let's use. Let's do it quick in the next couple months would okay. that be enough is that yes. enough time for you absolutely okay well, one more yes. question Pete. if I could counselor um, and I don't know if this is pertinent but with the widening of 41st Street we are are we annexing some of that property already that's been where we've the no we don't have oh. to annex anything um, but to clarify along and again I'm gonna speak for Stockwell so John can jump up and correct me when I'm wrong but when we construct 41st Street, we're improving the drainage for 41st Street. We're not correcting the storm drainage for Prairie Meadows. We're fixing the drainage for our project on 41st Street. So we bought properties along 41st Street yeah. for detention ponds, and those properties are the city of Sioux Falls, which we annexed in. So yes, we did annex properties, but not because of 41st Street or the Prairie Meadows neighborhood. Right. Jeff, when we have that next meeting, will you bring maybe a map showing specifically how, Prairie along Meadows? 41st Street, how that's going to be developed? Absolutely. I think that'll help us yep. talk about yes. the uh, next step. If I can ask one. Yes, you may, Kent. Councilor Jeff, Anderson. Is, is there some, and I may have forgotten, so I'm going to ask you, is there something that we discussed and we were going to bring up today that I've forgotten to ask you? Um, the Prairie Meadows neighborhood also is asking about the Daniels addition um, and they want to know about the detention ponds the storm drainage so we're going to take care of that Mark Cotter's agreed to look at that um, they want to know about the terms the interest um, and then the other thing that we haven't talked about really is Klein Avenue is the local street that's gravel right now and we maintain that we take care of that Klein um, because we have the Daniels addition driving through that I think that's about the last thing they really have talked about or hammered home to us is what are you doing with pave that well we maintain it we haven't paved it yet because that just elevates again more responsibility for a city on property that we're not really right responsible for but do we maintenance the gravel portion yes of we that? do so wouldn't it be better if we just paved it because maintaining gravel seems to cost a little extra it's except one for if we when we block yeah except from, for when we maintain it or if we main if we if we're going to do it, we want to put curb and gutter and stuff That's like that in when we want it, we when we do it. talked about today. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Kevin, thank you very much. Yeah. Or Jeff, thank you very much. You. Okay, next item on the agenda. Darren, are you ready? Talk about some TIFs. Yeah. Good evening, counselors. Uh, Darren Smith, Director of Community Development for the City of Sioux Falls. Um, I think uh, you folks know that for uh, much of the last year, we've been reviewing and evaluating the tax increment financing or TIF uh, process, and we've been engaged in conversations with uh, Sioux Falls Planning Commission members, um, Minnehaha County Commissioners and their staff, uh, the Sioux Falls School District, uh, I believe some city council members as well, um, those in the development community locally, and then, of course, internally uh, with our staff to uh, take the feedback that we've received over the last few years with the TIF process um, and see if there was a way that it could be done differently, could be done better. And uh, so uh, Brent is going to provide a brief, very brief presentation tonight. As you know, we were here a month ago to talk about the direction we were headed 
and what we felt good about. And so I think you're really going to like what you see tonight. And then um, our intention would be to uh, bring this forward to the city council uh, as early as, as next month. And then there will be a, a more detailed presentation and, uh, and a portion of the changes that we'll be proposing will be in ordinance. So many of the changes um, that we'll propose will or could be done um, at the administrative level in executing the TIF policy, but a portion of it will be through ordinance uh, with the city council's um, consideration and approval. So I'm going to let Brent, if he's ready, just go ahead and jump in. And Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Brent O'Neill with Community Development. Um, again, we did want to give just a short update, and I, I think the term you guys uh, used last time is if we give you a little bit of sneak peek uh, going into the council meeting uh, next month. Um, to reiterate uh, where we were, we, we did look at that process over a significant period of time, and there are really three key uh, benchmarks and achievements that we felt that came together as we went through this process. Uh, one, just improving the structure, the consistency, the clarity, for uh, how TIF uh, operates in general and how it's going to operate in Sioux Falls, uh, formalizing our application process, uh, again, bringing consistency to our process. And then third, and, and maybe more important than anything, is just improving our level of communication with the council, the public, other uh, public bodies, and so forth. I would like to touch on two things uh, in our presentation today. One is just that notification process, which is really tied to the communications piece. We did talk about this a little bit at our last meeting, but this, I think, is a better clarification of what our uh, proposed changes are. The first is we're going to uh, commit to notifying the city council, I mean, literally at the onset of receiving a TIF application, if for no other reason, just to put it on your radar that that application is in and is going to be uh, brought forward for consideration at a future date. Uh, the, the next item are related to both the Planning Commission hearing of TIF districts and the City Council's hearing of TIF districts. TIF districts. Uh, under the current procedures or, or old process, we've uh, been required to go to Planning Commission once and uh, City Council once. And our commitment going forward is to bring them to both bodies twice. As we talk to the Planning Commission, they are looking for just a little bit of an informational update as soon as we get an application but prior to the meeting where they're actually uh, asked to vote on a recommendation. And then the same with the council. We want to work with you before we bring it forward on the hearing date to get you the information you need ahead of time, whether that's through a, de excuse me, a detailed memo, a, a uh, land use meeting, a informational meeting, or even maybe we take it to the regular uh, council meeting once before uh, that public hearing meeting. But the real goal in that is to add extra opportunities for you guys to review it, ask questions, uh, dig deeper, uh, get a better understanding and a better handle on things before we move it forward to a vote. And then the third thing is providing more advanced notice to the taxing entities. Right now we're required to provide a notice to the county and school district uh, at least 10 days before the planning commission uh, votes on it. Uh, and, and we've certainly always met that requirement, but we're going to try to do a better job of getting it to them uh, farther ahead of time, too, so that uh, um, it, they don't feel that it's so far down the path before they have a chance to provide comment as well. A key component that we talked about at the last meeting that, that we wanted to reiterate here, you know, we do have some opportunities for additional uh, input, but it really doesn't affect our time frame for approval. In fact, it, our process as a whole probably tightens up the schedule a little bit because it brings some... Uh, conciseness and um, um, some level of uniform, uh, uniform procedures forward. We really feel that as we take this process forward, we're looking at a three to four month approval time frame, even with these uh, couple additions. Um, the best we could do it under the old process was three months. Uh, oftentimes it would take four or five, even six or seven months by the time we had quite a few conversations and went back and forth through the process. So the clarity in the process will help us uh, accelerate the approval schedule. And then the last thing, uh, Darren alluded to uh, uh, coming to the full council in October with an ordinance. And as we've looked at it and the various things that we could put in ordinance, the one thing that really emerged as the key thing was our application and a potential application fee. Um, the application, again, is just a uniform way of 
kind of that entry point of uh, TIF into the city. Uh, the old process involved a, a letter that spelled out some key details, but our uh, application requires some more uniform uh, submission of materials. But uh, the important thing that we're going to bring forward in uh, October is a, a proposed fee. And the fee is, really has two purposes, trying to recapture uh, the fees and the uh, expenses and the resources that the city puts in when a, a TIF district is created. Those include costs such as uh, any third party hiring where there's a direct expenditure involved. But that also involves the internal resources, the number of staff that are involved at various levels reviewing this, negotiating and so forth. The fees, uh, you know, we've discussed with others, uh, we're continuing to discuss. Uh, certainly we've got some ideas in mind what we need to have that fee at to recover our costs. And we've also compared other cities just to see if, you know, our costs are in line and our recapture component is in line. And those are, you know, they vary fairly widely. I mean, as low as $1,000 to as high as $10,000. And even at that $10,000 <coughs> level, there's some contingencies uh, that, that provide for cost overruns and so forth. Um, as we're discussing our uh, uh, proposal, it, it's really going to fall somewhere in that range uh, and, and likely in the middle. So that's what we want to bring forward uh, in October. With that, um, you know, Darren and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Council members, questions? Councilor Anderson. That's the number one question as you were given your presentation that came to mind. Are you looking for a recommendation from this committee, or is this just an informational? Um, it's it's uh, both. It's informational, but as, as we take it to this committee, we certainly want your endorsement and your uh, blessing as we take it forward, absolutely. Okay. And do we have any TIF applications in the, in the works right now that you can speak of, I suppose? Sure. You know, it seems that from time to time our door gets knocked on and people talk about a potential project here or there. Um, there's nothing in the hopper per se, but we are having conversations about potential projects that likely, uh, you know, as the people we're talking with build the model of their project, they would likely make a TIF request. Councilors, anything else? I would uh, like to, go ahead. I, uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, one other thing on the, uh, on the application process, uh, are all the applicants disclosed? Let's say if it's uh, a certain corporation as the, the owners of that corporation, are those disclosed so that you can read that within the TIF? Not just the company name? Sure, I, if I understand the question correct, you're, you're asking about uh, situations where a company has a very anonymous name, but it's tied to very specific entities or something like that. Um, the application, the requirement, I think, as we're putting it together, and I, I think we can discuss that, that point a little bit, the uh, intent is that they uh, um, provide the entity name that's applying, but that there really won't be any secrets about um, who the, the principles are of that entity. I mean, certainly if if you know company X is is applying for a TIF, they will be represented by certain principles, and we'll be talking with those principles, and that will be fully disclosed as we uh, bring them forward to this level. Maybe if I if I if I could, um, and that topic has come up before from time to time. I would say this: maybe at the local level, it is. Um, sometimes it's obvious who it is, and other times it is an LLC, and it's less obvious. Even when there is an LLC involved or a, a group that has formed, those are required by law to be registered with the Secretary of State's office. So it's not that that information has not been public or, or available. It's just that sometimes it requires the extra step maybe of going to the Secretary of State's office or website, doing a quick search on that LLC, and then it will say uh, who, the, who the primary partners are. If I may yes. continue this, I guess my feelings on that is if they're going to ask for TIF money from the mm -hmm. city, then we should know who's asking for that money. Absolutely. We shouldn't have to go another step. Yeah, no, I totally understand. And uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say that if that question were posed, 
uh, to those and it were made clear that that's an expectation that whether it's one council or the entire council, I think it's safe to say that that information would be provided or else that application would probably not go very far. Thank you. If I could, just one other yes. thing for clarification, going back to uh, Councilor Anderson's question. I think what we're um, looking for tonight, maybe more than anything, would be, um, and, and it's not required and it's at your discretion, would be perhaps just uh, um, support to you know, bring it forward to the council. Um, and we, we do not have um, what Brent or I would consider, you know, um, an application per se for another TIF project. But I think it's also probably fair to say that we do have what appears to be a fairly, a fairly serious project and a project that is, is somewhat significantly advanced that has strongly indicated to us that they will be coming in uh, at some point in the very near future and wanting to go through the TIF process. So what we have shared with them, been very open with the fact that this is something we're planning to bring forward and the timing is such that it may or may not get put in place before, but the expectation is that if the council approves the new process, including the fee and application, that that would apply to them and we'd make the timing of that work. And they're agreeable to that. So. Um, Maybe just a small sense of urgency that we, we do have to bring it forward in October and have it uh, considered. Um, and again, many of the pieces that we want to put in place to improve the process, we can do. Um, the one thing we cannot do without the City Council's approval is um, the creation of, or increase of a fee. And so that is the one that's really contingent upon, upon your approval is uh, the fee. Yes. So with our approval tonight, you would bring a more detailed plan oh, of the TIF yeah. process to an informational? Absolutely. Um, our plan, and again, we're open to feedback on that, our plan would be to um, bring uh, an ordinance forward in October that would have a first reading with a detailed presentation and then a second reading uh, for your vote. So we're open to an informational, but with a first reading, that essentially would be three presentations of it. And I, I, I guess if if that's if that was a plan, I guess I would like to see it at an informational okay. with the bringing to the ordinance, bringing as ordinance, yep. at a later date, not the same, not the sure. same date, so that we have time to digest and and look over your plan. If we. Um, if we, d if we meet, and I'll have to look at the informational agenda, um, agendas in October, the schedules, but if we would come forward at an informational, say in early October, with a first reading either that night or the following week, and then the second reading wouldn't be for a week or two later, would that be sufficient? I like the first option where it would be informational with bringing to the council the next week. Okay. Not the second same reading. Well, you would be taking three weeks then yeah. to get the uh, to get to the second reading. Yeah, we're fine with that. Absolutely. That? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that will work in October. Um, anyone else? Any other comments? A couple of things. Um, first thing I want to do is thank you. Thank you guys for putting this together because uh, these these TIFs seem to be kind of a floating entity out there that are magical and people think they're they're something that uh, people use to get away with not get away with but you know not pay taxes which in essence they they are not. Um, there are ways for us to um, to entice people to do projects um, and help and do some financing with them. And they are wonderful places to use them. Uh, there are bright places to use them. There are wrong places to use them. And by tightening up this application process and, and putting a process together on it, uh, uh, we're gonna make sure that number one, we're, we're much more transparent on it for the public in Sioux Falls uh, and for the people at home. And also for, for us to make uh, good decisions, not that we haven't made them before, but we have. But, uh, 
uh, we need to we need to have this and I think uh, I congratulate you for for doing this and that's why I wanted you to keep coming back until we you know until we we get this right um, I would um, also um, think that the that what Councillor Anderson was saying to bring it to the informational first is, is the right way rather than back to this group because uh, now we've got an idea let's get it to the information to the whole group and then move it forward in a uh, in a relatively fast fast manner so that we can uh, get it prepared for the next one that comes out uh, and is ready and we can uh, we can use the procedure and if it needs to be tweaked a bit there um, mm -hmm. we'll tweak it but uh, and I would also remind you that um, um, that really the final vote does come right down to the to the group on uh, on Tuesday evenings Absolutely. as to whether or not they're used and so to do this uh, uh, yeah this will make it a lot easier for us to know what's going on yeah. and that's uh, that's the main thing that we're looking out for the people of Sioux Falls and the, the proper use of our tax dollars so thank you. Yeah, thank you um, I would entertain a motion that would um, uh, direct and I'm going to put it that way direct you uh, Darren and uh, your department to make a presentation uh, of the uh, proposed ordinance to the October October 1st informational meeting okay. with uh, ordinance ready for the subsequent um, uh, uh, council meetings on the 8th and 15th for first and second reading could I, uh, would anybody be willing to make that uh, uh, motion? Since we're not doing it. <laughs> what? Since we're not doing a recommendation uh, because we don't have the plan in front right. of us, I think that's the oh. appropriate thing to do. So I'll motion that okay. we bring this to the informational October 1st. Any seconds? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, open discussion. Is there any open discussion uh, from the committee? Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yes, sir. All in favor? Aye. Yep. Opposed? Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, City.